Welcome everyone to the Hayman Center. Uh, we are here this evening to uh, celebrate the recent publication of Red Sea, Red Square, Red Thread, a philosophical detective story. Uh, the author, which is my colleague in the Columbia University Philosophy Department, Lydia Gear. Uh, Professor Gear is the author of <coughs> The Imaginary Museum of Musical Works, an essay in the philosophy of music, The Quest for Voice, Music, Politics, and the Limits of Philosophy, and Elective Affinities, Musical Essays on the History of Aesthetic uh, Theory. Uh, so here's how we're going to proceed this evening. Uh, uh, Lydia will uh, begin uh, with a few remarks about her book, after which, uh, we will have comments uh, by three friends and colleagues uh, who will speak in alphabetical order. First, Alex Albero, who is the Virginia Bledel Wright, 1951 professor of modern and contemporary art history at Barnard College and Columbia University. He's the author most recent, recently of Abstraction in Reverse, The Reconfigured Spectator in Mid-Century mid uh, Latin American Art. Uh, next, uh, Professor Greg Corbis, who's actually a professor emeritus of philosophy at the Pratt Institute. He works on the history and practice of philosophical aesthetics uh, with an emphasis on film, photography, and the visual arts. Uh, he asked me to, to say, to remark that he has written extensively on Arthur Danto, albeit not as extensive, extensively as, uh, as Lydia. Um, you said that. Uh, <laughs> last but not least, uh, another colleague, uh, Professor Rosalind Morse, an anthropologist, cultural theorist, and documentarian who is professor of anthropology at Columbia University. Her work uh, is addressed to the history and social lives produced in the interstices of industrial and resource based capitalism. Morse's written work encompasses a variety of forms from scholarly articles to ethnographic monographs, monographs essayistic prose and poetry. Uh, uh, her media works include documentary film and expanded uh, cinematic installation as well as opera. And most recently, just, just within the last week or so, Professor Morris is the recipient of a 2022 So uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Bob. I'm honored to be joined this evening by all these brilliant people. Um, I would like to acknowledge also my life partner who has sung Rudolfo in La Boheme so many times and whose recording Danto listened to with such pleasure in the very last days of his life. I want to thank also Oxford University Press for accepting yet another version of an imaginary museum, yeah. this time made not from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, but from a painting that has only ever existed through description. The painting being that of the crossing of the Red Sea is an ekphrasis, an image brought into thought experiments for the inquiring mind. My book has a main cast and a chorus of thousands. It's written without notes or quotation marks as a Passatin work in the style of Nietzsche, Benjamin Adorno, Wittgenstein, and many more who've experimented with philosophical form and expression. I rewrote every passage of borrowed material to create the chapters as parts of a whole, being advised to offer more signposts along the way. I wrote a late chapter on the very idea of posting a sign. My material is philosophical, historical, theological, political, literary, musical, theatrical, and operatic. It draws from the first lines of texts and artworks offered as thought images about the exodus, leading to all kinds of thoughts about freedom, liberation, emancipation. As a mystery story, the book tracks the very long history of a very short anecdote. I thank Rachel Eisenbart for that um, sentence. 
the a long history of a very short anecdote. The anecdote reads, commissioned to depict the biblical passage through the Red Sea, a painter covered a surface with red paint, explaining thereafter that the Israelites had already crossed over and that the Egyptians had drowned. Since there are 250 versions of the anecdote, it took me 13 years to, do, to draw out that most generic version that captured every other version. I treat the anecdote as akin to an enigmatic epigram, aphorism, or proverb. It gives out one meaning while withholding another. It gives something to plain sight and something to insight. And I argue that the wit lies in the movement between the two. By the anecdote, we see all and we see nothing, and then every shade of gray in between. Wittgenstein once imagined a good philosophical work being written entirely from jokes or the Witze that would waste no thought in facetiousness. He often had in mind the waste books of wit by Lichtenberg, who in turn borrowed from Shakespeare, a wit of brevity conditioned by the thought of no thought being either left out or unturned. It's very hard to be brief when writing a book about wit. That's meant to be funny. Okay, I can. <laughs> right, thank you, thank you. I need a laugh here then. The Red Sea anecdote was first told about a wall that left spectators with nothing to see, after which it was retold as about a red square canvas to be placed in the museum. From roguish tales about blank walls to the institutional walls of the museum, I follow a historical trajectory from a pre-modern to a modern history of the arts in all their agonistic contest and comparison. I treat the Argon in the Paragone as a battle as much between the different media of the arts as between modern nation states. On land and at sea, the wars are of trade, of merchandise, of piracy, and of property. A book written in five parts begins at the end with Arthur Danto's use of the Red Sea anecdote to produce his thought experiment of red squares for his book, The Transfiguration of the Commonplace. What impact had the exodus on his so-called end of art thesis when for the first time, so he claimed, art would be defined to include all art contra a history of constant exclusionary definitions. It took me a hundred pages to answer that question. Thus Greg's comment. Parts two and three ask what La Boheme has to do with the Red Sea Passage. Why does Puccini's opera begin with the painting a desire to murder Pharaoh, and what has the painter's murder to do with Mimi's death, also described as a murder at the end? How did this opera of such overwhelming beauty and sentiment cover over such a foul history of intolerance toward both Jews and toward Egyptians? The answer draws us back into the Paris of the 1840s to the, to the scenes written by the likes of Balzac, Mouget, Dumas, Hugo, of La Vie de Bohème, after which it pulls us back into the early narratives of exile, the Jews wandering and waiting for the promised land, and of punishment, the divine punishment of the Egyptians, who in a most extraordinary origination narrative, of which not a word could possibly be true, allegedly gave their name to the gypsies who traveling then through Bohemia, eventually arrived in France, recalled Les Bohemiens as coming from Bohemia. Wagner and Die Meistensinger of Nuremberg have a very great role to play in my story. The history of wandering is a history of persecution, prejudice, intolerance, conversion, appropriation, imposture, fraudulence the use and abuse of Jews and Egyptian gypsies in narratives of civilization and the modern nation states. It's a story of mistaken, disguised, 
and masked identities. Karl Marx would bring the entire mess and mass of an arriving people into Paris under the rubric of La Boheme. He was neither the first nor the last to do so. Parts two and four explore Kierkegaard's work through the lens of the Red Sea anecdote. I have a lot here to say about Hegel and Nietzsche and about their contributions to monochromatic formalism, to abstraction and mediation, to critique and complaint, and finally also to liberty and wit. Working through the history of abstraction, about which Alex is an expert, I turn to the color theory of Goethe to ask why, when devising his metaphor of the thread, he decided to name it red, the Rote Faden. After which I show how in the different parts, the red thread would bring the Red Sea into an immediate relation with the modern red, red squares of monochromatic art. Being red and being square carry the whole host of Nietzsche's mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms, as well as Goethe and Wittgenstein's families of many-sided relations and resemblances. I propose a reading for Goethe's red thread, Kierkegaard's anecdote, and the art history of the monochrome, all as intriguingly interconnected. Part five explores the pursuit of liberty through a micrology of wit, the wit as made through telling details. By telling details, I mean the little details overlooked in translation, the wit of small things that turn one meaning into another. The 18th century, known as the age of analysis or criticism, is better named the age of wit, a wit designed to counter the bad prejudices of taste and intolerance. Without wit, no liberty. Without wit, no aesthetic theory and no judgment. The 18th century saw the birth of the Red Sea anecdote. Hogarth was named the painter in the story. Why Hogarth? Why, moreover, is there allegedly a drowning of Pharaoh in the first image of Hogarth's marriage a la mode? What has the French a la mode to do with securing a Brexit on Beer Street to counter the importing, importation of gin from across the channel? You really have to know your hogarth to get all that. <laughs> <laughs> How does the Red Sea anecdote play to the modern war of nations, trade, and translation? All who use the anecdote, and there are about 250 people who do in my book, are linked by an associationism that reveals the genealogy of anxiety and influence. Most of my cast is male, but do not be deceived. I wrote the book to draw out the repeated, concealed, and unexpected threads of wit and liberty for those very many who have been denied a voice. Yesterday, I was teaching Isaac Dennison's story, The Blank Page. It's written with veiled words. It tells of one blank tablet ending a series of tablets, each inscribed by the stained blood of women. The blank plate, like the painting in the Red Sea anecdote, hits the unwritten future against a very stained past. The French read the anecdote not with the Egyptians having been already drowned, but as not yet having arrived on the scene. In every repetition, we stand in the moment of the present with another opportunity. In every repetition of the anecdote, a detail is changed. A change in something very small may be of large consequence for the entire picture. I'm often advised to pick my battles Thank you for the, I'm often advised to pick my battles. It's taken me a lifetime to know what this means. Less is sometimes more. So I promise that my next book will be exceedingly short. Thank you.
Okay, well, I'm very happy to participate on this panel celebrating this magnificent book. I was captivated by the ingenious way Red Sea, Red Square, Red Thread probes art, music, literature, and cultural history more generally to study the Red Sea emancipation narrative and the anecdote of the red monochrome painting representing the biblical crossing of the Red Sea. I found the detailed way that Lydia probes how the many artists, philosophers, and writers who took up the Red Sea anecdote twisted and turned it from so many perspectives, extraordinarily ambitious and inventive. The narrative's detective story format, flinging riddles and clues at readers like spigots at the Trevi Fountain, <laughs> made it difficult to stop turning the pages and put the volume down. For those of you who haven't yet taken in this book, let me just say that reading Red Sea is like getting to corner Lydia in a room and asking her everything you ever wanted to know about aesthetics <laughs> and having her explain meticulously over 600 plus pages, which incidentally makes her book the longest I've read since I sat through Keith Richards' mesmerizing memoir, <laughs> Life, which was published a decade ago. <laughs> Indeed, the two books, Keith Richards' Life and Lydia's Red Sea, but obviously different in many ways, share a remarkable amount too. They both transcend mere commentary and become important contributions to cultural history, musicology, philosophy. They both offer abstract theories of interpretation. They're both exceedingly witty and they're both a real pleasure to read. While I'm not sure that Lydia will completely agree with this, methodologically, I locate Red Sea as a critical theory reflection on Arthur Bechtel's aesthetics, politicizing his point of view by adding a necessary social critique to Danto's essentially analytical pursuit of how artworks differ from mere things. Not surprisingly, the origin of that social critique for Lydia largely comes from the Frankfurt School and the theories uh, and the specter of Theodore Adorno's aesthetic theory in particular hovers over the entirety of the text. But the social critique also comes from the writings of Walter Benjamin, whose materialist mode of inquiry in the Passagenberg, where he juxtaposes different passages of thought and material, Lydia employs to good effect. Like Benjamin, Lydia offers indirect communications and colorful detours. She pursues the ways of critique by using diversionary tactics and signposts to produce evocative and explosive constellations of thought images, insisting that they're hermeneutically, insisting that they're hermeneutically truth revealing in ways straight linear arguments can never be. Lydia collects all kinds of material sources with the detective's ear and eye, never ceasing to deep, deeper and deeper into the depth of the archive. As she puts it, she unpacks the contributions of philosophical furniture art to a modernist discourse on property and asks how property comes to pertain to thinking about the ownership of things as products of body and mind. The Red Sea's thought experiments don't just seek to relate something about aesthetic philosophy. They also seek to touch readers, jolting us into recognizing the incredible richness of things. In fact, it's the way Red Sea explicates this richness that makes the book so original and forceful. Like Keith Richards' life, Lydia flings protocol to the wind in Red Sea and does it her own way on her own terms with an enormous amount of wit and a liberty of mind. Now I have a few questions or clusters of questions that I'd like to contribute to our conversation. Let me ask these directly to Lydia. First, as a point of curiosity, tell us why your text summons verbs so repeatedly, might there be an anxiety coming to the surface in the retelling of Barnett Newman's proclamation that aesthetics are to artists what ornithology is to birds? And what was the effect of Danto's changing the retort to substitute art subjects with its objects to saying that aesthetics is for art what ornithology is for birds? Secondly, you excavate so many, 250 you just mentioned, tellings of the Red Sea anecdote and philosophy and the arts. Which in the end do you think is the most, which do you think are the most intriguing? <laughs> and, I mean, that's, third, what's the role of negation in the trajectory of representation that you follow? And I don't mean negation in the critical theory sense, but negation as a formal elimination of what you describe on page 546 
as substance, content, mindedness, and purpose from representation. I ask this because in the book, you seem to, on the one hand, accept that the most minimal condition for something to be art is that it figures, and on the other, to see everything as having the ability to figure, to me. Perhaps this is your debt to Dante, but I'd argue that for many 20th century artists, modernist reduction functioned as a way to eliminate all of the codes and conventions and iconographical residue of the past in order to arrive at a literal degree of form. The reduction to the literal zero degree was carried out in the hopes that it would enable the emergence of a new beginning, a new kind of figuration, a new set of codes and conventions, a new world. But your reading, or your reading of Dacto's and Hogarth's and Kierkegaard's reading, carries iconography into that negative space, into that zero degree of form, allowing it to continue to signify in its nothingness. Ground, said Hogarth to the outwitted nobleman, there is no ground, the red you perceive is the Red Sea, or in my terms, literality, there is no literality, the literal you perceive is always already figuring. So my question is, are you going the distance with Hogarth and refusing the possibility of a zero degree of signification? Does the literal always have a figurative or metaphorical dimension? And finally, given uh, that, as you convincingly show, a red monochrome painting can signify in so many different ways, and that apart from the scale of the painting in question, and perhaps a particular shade of red, the monochrome painting's visual appearance, what it gives to the merely seeing eye, doesn't in itself provide a plurality of meaning. Would you argue again with Danto that it's essentially the title that directs the monochrome painting's meaning, that titling a red monochrome painting, a depiction of the Red Sea, renders it such? Or is it perhaps the discursive context in which the monochrome painting is located that endows it with meaning? So four questions, birds, the anecdote, negation, and titles. And I'll, I'll leave it. Yeah, so um, thank, thank you, Alex. So um, I'm just going to follow up. Well, I, that's what I was about to do. Um, I, I was just going to say I'm, I'm not the first this evening, and I won't be the last to thank Lydia for this really remarkable book. And um, I'm going to try to express my gratitude the only way I know how, which is trying to figure out what it feels like to live inside this argument. I'm going to fail, but I'm going to try. Um, so Hilary Putnam is reputed to have said that any philosophy that can be put in a nutshell belongs in one. Um, <laughs> um, but, if, but if we heed Putnam's warning, then how to fulfill this evening's assignment to say something both celebratory and informative in eight to 10 minutes um, about Lydia Gore's extraordinary new work of aesthetics and philosophy of history and politics and, um, well, if I just list all the fields um, that Lydia chose, I'll use up my time, so I'll stop there. Um, let me stick my neck out then by observing that Lydia's book does invite us to pack it into a nutshell. The aim of Red Sea, Red Square, Red Thread is simply this, to hunt down the origin of an anecdote as off misattributed, at least until now, um, as it is told, about an artist who fulfills his commission to paint the crossing of the Red Sea by daubing a wall red. Um, when pressed by the discontented patron, the artist explains the resultant monochrome represents the Israelites already having crossed and the Egyptians already drowned. What could be nuttier than that? <laughs> but it turns out that getting from here to there and now to then, here and now being the New York of 40 years ago when Arthur Danto used the anecdote at the start of his 1981 book, Transfiguration of the Commonplace, there and then being the layers of scabrous wits on 18th century Grub Street, that getting from here to there and now to then requires following a twisted line through time from the axial age to the 1980s and across space from Egypt to Paris to New York. Like the story that overarches the Red Sea passage, passage of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt to New York. There's an awful, thank you. There's an, <laughs> there's an awful lot jammed inside the protected nutshell of Lydia's anecdote. But still, why write a whole big book about this anecdote? 
Lydia's philosophical excuse is that good anecdotes like jokes and myths and legends are complex mechanisms of transmission and communication across different cultural and political moments. They cut through history on a slant. And they do so not because they're in any sense outside of the cultures they inhabit, but rather because they reveal their meanings differently in their various contexts, in all of which true believers falsely believe that the real meaning has been revealed to them. As Lydia puts it, exemplary of all that an anecdote can do, the Red Sea anecdote is choose a one-sided posture in the many theologically laden battles between philosophy, politics, morality, and the arts. I like this idea that anecdotes have agency, that akin to Bartleby, they can eschew commitment. But why Lydia's emphasis on anecdotal reframing? Sorry, hard to say, anecdotal reframing. Um, their fecundity notwithstanding, anecdotes like jokes are helplessly dependent on those who tell them. We all know people who can't tell jokes, helplessly dependent on those who tell them, and especially on those who tell them with the theological certitude that is both expressed in and betrayed by their partiality. Anecdotes are like rumors, the authority of which is both borrowed and self arrogated The persistence of good anecdote then is a matter of its ability to fold in on itself in the telling, thereby to keep a distance from the authoritative teller. Claude Levi Strauss wrote that quote, the contrast which prevails between ritual and myth is the same as between life and thought. And ritual debases thought in order that it should meet the requirements of life. As with myths, so with anecdotes. Their easy accommodation to the interests of the tellers protects them from the fate of ritual, which is to vanish with the form of life that gives it purpose. And as the novelist Susan Dage puts it, survivors are allowed the liberty of interpretation. In this light, we can see that Lydia's tale of the telling of the anecdote, the painting of the Red Sea Passage, her telling of it mimics the overarching story of the Exodus itself, of that is a departure into history from the bondage of the authoritative first moment. Now, at risk of piling nutshell on top not nutshell, um, I, will, I would say that Lydia's recitation of the transit into history of an exodus, as it were, from the mythical exodus, is the core both of her thinking and her achievement. Lydia's interest in the exodus legend focuses on the price paid for freedom, counted in drowned Egyptians and murdered firstborn children, and on the historical afterlife of paying that price. But it's also shaped by Cynthia Ozick's observation about the centrality to the Exodus story of the ethical regard that's due to the stranger. That is, you shall love the stranger as yourself because um, you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I'm embarrassed that I had to look down to read that, sorry. Um, okay. Here is Lydia on Ozick, quote, to mark the Israelites as strangers in Egypt did not preclude the continuation of their estrangement out of Egypt. The Exodus concept as an experience of estrangement marked a first exit or a glimpse of freedom, after which came the passage in a wilderness construed as an in-between state, a no longer being at home and a home not yet reached." End of quote. In other words, the story of emancipation is never ending because it begins only with the departure from the ideal of the natal home from which the stranger is excluded. Um, emancipation always begins in medias race. It's achieved not by returning home, but in being able to live without making false contracts with actualities. Or as it is asked entirely non-rhetorically in Psalm 137, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Lydia names this ability wit, which she defends by exercising it. Um, Quote, walking through discourses of emancipation, persecution, and prejudice, we must keep our wits about us. A very lovely turn of phrase. Um, we must remain alert to the deft unsettling of meaning characteristic of wit, but also we must keep company with the wits. We must keep our wits about us. We must keep company with the wits, like Hogarth and Kierkegaard, 
who transmit to us the unsettlement of contracts. While reading Lydia on wit, I was reminded of a legend about Yogi Lukacs, which was rehearsed just this past week in The New Yorker by Louis Menand. When he was arrested as the Hungarian uprising was crushed in November 1956, Lukacs was asked by the arresting officer if he was carrying any weapons. <laughs> he handed over his pen. <laughs> a painful but witty refusal to sign false contracts. So let me close by expressing my admiration for Lydia's sustained and challenging micrological, by the way, um, word does not like micrological, it prefers micrological, <laughs> which works just as well. Um, <laughs> challenging micrological attention to the rogues gallery of satirists, parodists, and spoof artists through whose wit the legend of the Red Sea passing is passed on to us to make of it what we can. I was reminded of Herder's own japing return to the Egyptians in this two of philosophy and history, whose destiny, that is the Egyptians, whose destiny in Western history, he thought, was helplessly dependent on forms of transmission they would have scorned. Herder writes, despite all the contrasts to the ways of thinking, the Egyptians and the Phoenicians were twins of the same Oriental mother, who together later educated Greece and thereby the world. They were thereby both instruments of transmission in the hands of destiny. And if I may stick to the allegory, the Phoenician was the more adult boy who ran about and peddled the remnants of ancient wisdom and ingenuity for a quick coin in the markets and the streets. How much the education of Europe owes to the swindling, avaricious Phoenician. Lydia is Herder's more adult boy. I hope for her quick coin, but the honor she is due for her country, but the honor she is due is for her contribution to our education. Are we ready? Well, I. I also want to thank Lydia um, and the Heyman Center for the opportunity to respond to this book, this monumental, beautiful, fun, crazy, wild adventure. Um, what can an anthropologist say to a book like Red Sea, Red Sea, Red Sea? I'm going to answer that question with some additional characters from my own anecdote. <laughs> At times, I felt I was dreaming of this book. It happened to me, as Freud says of dreams. Words became image, unpredictable, and aware. Between the enigma and the explanation, I found myself following. Red Sea, Red Square, Red Thread partakes of the logic of the dream work, impelled by the force of metonymy with displacement along the chain of signifiers being driven by contact or contiguity. One thing leads to another, to many others. There is also a metaphoric element in the text which cross cuts the metonymic chain and it is sustained by a double concept of the mosaic. In the first, the mosaic is the mythopoetic tradition in which Moses is prophet, leader, the last one to have had direct contact with God and the one destined to exile. The second is that described by Krakauer as the imaginal in which the assembly of fragments generates an image in which the fishers and discontinuities between the constitutive elements remain perceptible. Well, you've heard the anecdote uh, described here, so I won't repeat that. But in many of the iterations of La, La Boheme, including the opera, where the story recurs as an inaugural event always to be forgotten, Go tells us, the exiles are refigured and re-racialized re to generate a smug new aesthetic of humanism that valorizes its own marginality to economy and power in order to assert its superior, but not necessarily radical judgment. In describing this non-class, right, the author, Henri Mouget, and I quote uh, uh, our, our colleague here, who never quite quotes anybody, uh, I quote, engaged a cant of the commonplace to condemn variously a pedantry Puritanism and mediocrity in the academy, and the spiritless consumerism on the street. 
I take this to be one of the statements that Gera wants to reanimate for our time, that against which she wishes to defend critique. The Red Sea anecdote stages at least three problems. One, how to think the problem of art as a phenomenon on the threshold between the visible and the invisible. Two, how to think passage as emancipation disconnected from the assumption of arrival. Three, how to think the first two as the basis of a critical practice that differentiates itself from complaint and that maintains the philosophical demand for analytic rigor. The first two are related in Dante's work insofar as he was attempting to conceive, as, as Libby has already said, he was attempting to conceive of art in a way that uh, not reliant on substantivist criteria. He advocated a radically open, inclusive notion of art from which absolutely nothing could be excluded a priori. Still, one might say that the red thread of the Red Sea and its constant proximity to and appearance in red squares, both aesthetic and political, invites a more general meditation on redness. On redness as the signifier of color, but also the incapacity to know what color is, or if color is, or so I thought while reading. It's an old anthropological problem, Franz Boas having written a dissertation on the impossibility of knowing the color of water in any absolute sense. Two thoughts came to mind reading this magnificent tome. The first was a recollection of my first undergraduate class in the anthropology of art, which commenced with a discussion of Northwest Coast masking. These masks needed to be grasped in their law determined essence as to be danced. The first thing to understand, as I recall it, is that the heavy use of red next to black in the designs associated with the masks worn in winter rituals when the night was long was dictated by the fact that red is the first color to disappear in the dark for human eyes. This threshold color could therefore be made to do a certain work in the signification of the relation between the worldly and the other world, visible and the invisible. The second thought was prompted by an early line in Anne Carson's autobiography of Red. The line is, when Homer mentions blood, blood is black. This black can also disappear, drain away. While Parsons' book evokes the story of Geryon, a character in ancient Greek myth, and the object of a poem by Stesikouros, an ecrastic poem. Geryon is a winged monster, that threshold creature, all red, who lived on an island called Erethia, meaning the red place. He was killed by Heracles. In the sixth fictionalized fragment of Stesikouros that appears in the autobiography of Red, Athena is described as looking down at the death of Gary. The sequence ends with a fragment comprised of the following two lines. The red world and corresponding red princess went on. Gary on. did not. So this predicament of not going on, even when others do, the order that others go on is often figured in Western art history as a mosaic predicament. It has other forms in classical myth. One of those forms is that suffered by Eurydice at the end of Sophocles' tragedy, Antigone. <clears throat> Creon's wife and Haman's mother, Eurydice commits suicide at the end of the play, just as Antigone has done, although her death is almost an afterthought in this first of the Sophocles tragedies in the Oedipal cycle. Anne Carson translated Antigone at least twice, once under the title Antigone for a production by Ivo van Hoeven, and then as Antigonic, which is a kind of verse ontology in which all of the readers of Antigone get their say. Hegel, Brecht, Butler, Zizek, Amin, and others. This latter version, Antigonic, borrows Brecht's alienation techniques to comment on the oddity of Riddiki's first and last appearance. It includes a monologue, not a monologue, a monologue, which far exceeds what appears in Sophocles' text and Carson's earlier adaptation for Van Hoeven. Nonetheless, in all of these versions, 
he really appears while making offerings to the goddess Pallas Athena, the one who looked down on the red space as Geryon is being slaughtered. This now extended monologue, which is nonetheless delivered in the third person, reads as follows. This is Eurydice's monologue. It's her only speech in the play. You may not know who she is. That's okay. Like poor Mrs. Ramsay, who died in a bracket into the light. This reference to Virginia Woolf's novel collapses all the levels of the text. The event occurs on the page between the punctuated brackets. It also occurs in the world to which the text refers. On this basis, Woolf made her radical claim about the gender prohibition on mourning those who die in a time of war, but who are not killed in battle. Who is excluded, asks Woolf, when only heroic death is grieving? Now, this is not unrelated. I hope it already appears to you. This is not unrelated to the notion of art as emancipation offered by Danto in the opening section of Greer's book. Danto's argument in 1964, writes Greer, was to say that artworks admit mutually contradictory predications. And I quote, her quoting, not quite, one sees red paint while really red as a, at a different order of being. Or to quote Maurice Denny, as she does in attributing to Danto the concept of a mosaic mimesis, a picture before being a battle horse, a nude woman, or some animal, is essentially a playing surface covered with colors assembled in a certain order. Not unlike the phenomenon of death in a square bracket, mosaic mimesis entails, quote, seeing the invisible and the visible, how the ratio, proportion, and harmony infused and unified, only seemingly disparate parts. Now, Gero tells us that the harmony is, or that harmony is a translation of the Greek term, Eurythmia, which shares the root of Eurydice's name, often translated as justice or balance. In any case, the upshot was for Danto, a theory of art as that which fails, quote, again, not quite, if it is indiscernible from reality, but that it also fails if it is not. Moving from Kierkegaard's anecdote and all of the works that seem haunted by it, there follows Dante to the recurring moments in which art threatens to disappear into its medial base until finally this disappearance becomes the point. As with Rauschenberg, who insisted on the instability of the line between the ordinary thing and art, with the positing of art emerging precisely in this formulation as a threshold phenomenon dependent on the risk of the distinction's collapse. Quasi's blank is mentioned in this context quite literally. Another quote, but not quite. Another image to instruct all those standings before a blank wall that crossing countries from black to blanc, white, one might see the all of art or nothing at all. The translation is indexed at the level of the signifier by a near homonymy that opens onto a difference and a disappearance. Black blanc, perhaps in between blank or white, or red in the pot of mask makers, perhaps new. This play, I am now referring to Lydia's play, this play and it is play, or perhaps, as Greer refers to it, this critical wit, which is most active when translation is at stake, is in this book proffered as an integral part of critical practice, as we've already heard. Nietzschean laughter is operative here. Wittily, Greer says we must keep our wits about us, not least because it enables the exposure of the one who claims exclusive rights. In answer to Hegelian cunning, the book is full of Beckettian humor and that of Stern, and especially Christopher Scott. This is what reminded me of Carson's Antigone Nick. In one of the manic dialogues between the two sisters, Antigone and his many, we encounter the following dialogue with which I will close my remarks. With all the questions in the blank spaces. Here is Antigone. We begin in the dark. 
and birth is the death of us. Is many. Who said that? And TV. Hagar is many. Sounds more like Becky. And TV. He was paraphrasing Hagar. Is many. I don't think so. <laughs> Lydia, might you respond? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, overwhelmed. Um, I have my wits about me. <laughs> um, the, uh, these were incredible comments. <laughs> I naturally can't do justice to any of them. Um, but um, what, comes, what comes out of your remarks um, it is a feeling that there's another book to be written <laughs> that I left so much out. <laughs> there's so much more to be said. And in a way, that's a good thing um, because it, uh, it means there's uh, lots of spaces in my book for more thinking. I didn't write a closed book. I think I even wrote that, that it's open. Um, the, uh, um, I, I think all of you, um, stressed um, the aspect of wit, the nature of the wit. Um, the word I've been working on Freud recently, this is my new thing. And um, I wish I'd known more before I'd written this book. But the, the idea of um, wits carries so much uh, connotation that is lost in the English word wit and um, the uh, pathology and the psychosiology of wit, um, which gives rise to Freud's remarkable readings of Moses and the foot and the tiny details. This micrology is um, so much seen as a modern method and a, uh, an awareness of details, but um, actually goes back to Lichtenberg and Goethe um, of, and so on, and then back to um, the 18th century. Um, and one of the things I tried to do in my book is that is to, um, we often associate the names with certain kinds of ideas. We say Dante this, and uh, Kierkegaard this, and Hegel this, and we, we all have our readings which we transmit through our classes and through the university and they get followed. And I wanted to show um, by my method just how much had been borrowed, how much, um, in a way, I framed my book to begin with Danto and then to read everything that Danto had read. And since I knew Danto's apartment really well, I knew his library. And I started at the beginning and pretty much <laughs> spent the years reading everything he'd read and found that, of course, he rarely got personal past the first page. I know this in many instances. Um, he called me up and said, you know, I've just uh, been reading Adorno's aesthetic theory. By the end of page one, I realized I'd already said it much better myself. And I said, you could read a little more, Arthur, you know, it wouldn't do you any harm. But he, he kind of got taken by a first page. And in some ways, um, I shared that feeling I could admit never to have written, read, read past the first page of any book that, that might you might think that if you read carefully. Um, and but what I did is you you begin to read a book and you you see the setup and then you start thinking and all your thinking starts to inflect into between the lines of what you're reading and you start to write your own book between the lines. So in a certain way I decided to do that and show this constant borrowing of material, but then with Freud, of course, and others to note the interesting mistakes that they make when they take up material, the mistakes of translation. And I'm no linguist, but I had to do a lot of work on language, but to check every translation and every term and to see the mistakes that had been imported through the tradition. So that, um, uh, that was one thing that sort of governed my project. You, know, you asked me why birds, because birds um, was for Dante, for Hegel, for so many thinkers, the, um, the sort of um, marked a doubleness in relation to humanity. Birds could fly, 
we all wish to fly, they belong to nature, we all wish we were natural, and yet they can't see the Red Sea, they only can peck at the red paint. So Zoitsis and the birds becomes a founding myth for the history of birds throughout the book, which goes into Barnett Newman, who was um, who took up this quip, um, as you noted. And for each motif and every term, I try to follow a history of repeated uses. So although my um, book is made through kind of a tapestry of passages, each, um, and I, I kind of sustained this by the kind of index I produced, you can actually thread every term through the entire book as if it's an individual thread. So if you want to know about the, any term, including the idea of a red thread, I have a history but my histories are not the usual histories we know. So the threads are pulled to rewrite the history of all these things we know so well, literally to defamiliarize, uh, to create the sense of, I really thought I knew that story, but never did I know it in these terms. And I like that rewriting of the material. Who knew that in the, um, the, uh, the masterpiece on Connu, the um, chef de uh, Balzac's famous story, is told in the center of it, the Red Sea anecdote? Nobody knows that. Who knows where Kierkegaard got his anecdote? These, these sort of silly questions of detection actually help us to rewrite the history. And most of all, what I wanted to do, I'm not really answering your questions because I can't, is I wanted to rewrite a history that is so stained by continuously foul complaint. We pick out our authors that we condemn as anti-Semitic, anti-Gypsy, anti-this, anti-this, but it's the history that carries these threads through. I, by the end of the book, I hated everybody. I mean, I, I felt a kind of disgust even towards myself. Um, at the history we'd read. It's a filthy history, and it's only gotten worse in the last two years. And I wrote this during the Trump era. So, I mean, it was, it was really brought home to me. But how do you break out of those patterns that normalize this persecution that's turned into humor, these jabs against peoples and so on? So I, it was trying literally to write this history against the grain as Benjamin so well put it, rub the wood in a different direction. More I will say later, or never again. <laughs> so we have time for you know, maybe 10 minutes or so of, of questions, discussion. Philip, yes, please. Philip. Yeah. I'm so sorry, so, for the online audience, could we trouble you to step up here and ask it into the owl. I know it's a little bit. Talk to the owl. I hope I didn't turn the owl off. That's OK. Oh, thank you for being so bold. So I, I'm going to ask a question on the basis still of not having read more than a quarter of the book. <laughs> but it seems to me that, uh, that you've, your self-description does something of an injustice to yourself. That is, I, I think you are in the in the tradition of aphorism. That's very clear. But there's a sense in which the people whom you mention, Wittgenstein, Nietzsche, Lichtenberg, all, all use aphorisms atomically. Whereas what's special I, I felt about the, the book so far it, mm. is that all of these anecdotes, all of these aphorisms are deeply interconnected. And so we get this incredible sort of laying out of a tapestry where, as you say, everything is connected to everything. So I think of you as doing something which is actually a novel genre. And that's, that inspires the question. Is this simply something that arises from a very odd concatenation of circumstances that enables the genre to be, to be manifest in this one example? Or is it something that other philosophers or other thinkers in various disciplines, because you, you know, you're spanning so many disciplines, uh, could actually emulate? 
I know you want to. Uh, um, I know you want you want to write a short book next, but uh, I mean, if if you were to go on, is there are, are there other instances that you could see the same kind of 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 mosaic tapestry? Call it what you will being constructed. Um, so that's the question. But I will close by defending Arthur Danto's uh, reading habits. J. L. Austin, whom I'm sure Arthur has read, once said that when philosophy is done well, all the action is over by the bottom of the first page. Exactly. And, <laughs> and that's that's the reason you stop. I mean, yeah. now now I know what the framework is, <laughs> and I go on, which is essentially I thought what you were saying. But it, 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 no, that's right, and. Um... One does feel it. It's a sort of nice feeling that you start a book and you start thinking for yourself and just go away and start writing. I, I mean, um, I'm not of their caliber, but I, I do that rather a lot myself. But um, the, what one, I, I did feel a pressure in this book. You, if you read um, not to dawn its aesthetic theory, but his minimum moralia, which is a better example, or you read Benjamin's Passage and Verb. The Passage and Verb was never written. It was a collection of things put together. And if you read Wittgenstein's investigations, their pieces put together and so on. A lot of these are posthumously put together, but we spend hours and hours trying to work out the connection between the pieces. Why does this minima, that this morality, moral follow on from this one and so on? And we try to construct it. At the beginning of this project, I intended only to write passages without connections between them and to just be really smart and leave everyone else to do the work. But Given my training, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't stop with that. I didn't have either the confidence just to stop with the passages. I wanted to say, well, how are they actually connected? And then I thought it was uh, actually, and this what took so many years. I would draw all this material, read all these stories from different languages and different periods, and then try to make a a thread through the chapter, whereas if you read each passage, you would actually get an argument for the whole. And yet there would be a, a thread joining it together, a pattern that would come out so that I could say this chapter is about this and it, it shows this or it argues this. It's not a regular form of argument, but it, what it does, it, um, it's a way of writing which allows um, philosophers, and I think they need to do this more, um, a confidence to draw and really respect the material of other disciplines. I think um, quite often philosophers are so disrespectful of the material from other disciplines that um, I'm the contrary. Um, Alex and I go out for drinks regularly and he says, oh, you're going to write a book, it's going to be all philosophy, and then he writes a book that's all philosophy, and I say, where's the material, and I write the book, it's all material, and he says, where's the philosophy? So it's, um, it's what I wanted to do was, um, in a sense, um, put philosophy into conversation with this incredible material being produced by so many disciplines, in part also to challenge the incredibly um, ruinous divisions between the departments of academia. It's it, I've done this my entire life. It's only gotten me into trouble. You know, people say, do you do musicology or philosophy? I just think I do neither both. I mean, I, I do what I do. I try to think and I read and I wanted to cross languages and I wanted to respect other languages. And I wanted, and I, I just tried to let the material produce its connections. And that I think is um, something I try to hand down to my students as a way of thinking to give them courage because they're so naturally good at this these days. Um, and whether it, it doesn't become a method for philosophy because the very idea of method is fraught with problems. So that's what I would say. But on the other hand, I would say nobody should try this. I mean, it takes your entire life. <laughs> so, you call that a life, says the joke. But yeah. Just one other thing, if I may. Um, there's right in the middle of the book, the dead center of the book, 
is it about a moment in the history of Exodus when the persecution of the Jews and the persecution of the gypsies, so-called Zigoyna center, many, many names that the opinions were so terrible in the European lands and that the Jews decided that for their safety, they would travel as Egyptians in disguise because the Jews were regarded as a more severe threat to Christianity and problems with conversion than the gypsies who were just regarded as godless scum of the earth. At that moment of disguised identity that brought the Jews and the Egyptians under the same masks is really for me the centerpiece of a history that people don't know. People always think that the Jews and Egyptians are divided by the Exodus story, by the history of Judaism. But there's a moment where they become, in Dante's terms, indiscernible. They wear the same masks and so on. And there's something about the, the race complexities of the race theory that comes out right in the middle of that book. And that, for me, was the um, most telling thing for me in this entire process of learning about the complexities of these terrible passages of persecution um, and shocked to the core by them. But I put it dead center in my book, meaning that everybody would miss it because you always read the beginning and the end and you <laughs> then get to the middle. So um, I just wanted to say that because that's deeply serious and it's going on all over the world today. Well, and it makes me sick. You know, it's past 7.15. Is it? Thank oh, you for uh, affording us an occasion for such a fabulous event. And thank all of the uh, friends and commentators. And then thanks, Philip, for your question. Uh, and thank all of you for coming.